here for seven years uh, since uh, 2015. And uh, so the, uh, basically I'm, you know, with great pleasure to introduce you the Nobel Symposium delegation. Uh, we just had a, a wonderful event in Stellenbosch last week for the launch of Nobel in Africa. And uh, now I'm bringing five distinguished guests uh, to, to our university to engage with our faculty and students and so on. So I hope you can take this opportunity to talk to them uh, as much as you can and to introduce yourself and introduce your research, okay? So uh, without further delay, let me just uh, uh, get my uh, uh, head of school, uh, Dr. Ross Robinson to give a few words, please. Yeah, Come over yeah please. Thank you, Yenzi. I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the School of Chemistry and Physics. I'd like to start just briefly by thanking uh, Francesco and Yenzi for all the hard work that they've done to organize this event and a lot of other people that have helped out. So Dr. Frost, Thomas Conrad, and many, many other colleagues. So thank you for all of your hard work. But uh, I'd like to not take a lot of your time today. What I'd really like to do is just welcome our distinguished guests from all around the world. Welcome to the University of Quasar Natal and to Durban. And we look forward to engaging with you over the next few days. So thank you very much and welcome to the school. Thank you. Okay, so um, so basically we are soon with, uh, with uh, Professor Neil Turok's talk. Uh, Neil, can you share your screen? Uh, I still have, can't, uh, you, can't see you to share your screen. Uh, and open your camera, please. Okay, there it is. Okay, so um, I will just remind you that uh, in the evening we'll have a public outreach uh, talk in the Senate chamber by Professor Moen uh, Jensen from Denmark and Professor Angelo Wupiani from where's Andrew? Where's Andrew? Andrew there over there uh, from Rome. And tomorrow we'll have uh, two public lectures also at the Senate chamber from ten to twelve. So uh, uh, by Professor Eric Anru from Sweden and uh, uh, Professor Luca Gametoni from Italy. Yeah. So uh, so please, uh, you know, make, make yourself and, and, and let your friends know that we have this exciting event. So without further ado, let me uh, quickly introduce you to the, to the speaker now, Professor Neil Trug. Uh You can see here, let me just uh, double click. Yeah, this is Neil. Yes, uh, Neil is a, is a very famous cosmologist. He is currently the inaugural chair, Higgs, Higgs chair of theoretical physics at the University of Edinburgh. He was also the uh, previous director uh, of the Premier Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada, also the inaugural director of the famous African Institute for Mathematical Science in Cape Town. So, um, I mean, he has a long list of awards and etc. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, you know, to repeat, uh, you know, this, this this thing. I think I send you uh, his uh, basically a brief introduction on email, etc. And also uh, here on poster, so you can read out if you're interested. So um, that's new. So then later on, we'll have another speaker, Armita, uh, who will talk about biophysics. So I will introduce Armita in the after news talk. So Neil, now let's uh, uh, now the floor is yours. Yours. Let me uh, let me share your screen. Let me. Uh, can I go back to the screen sharing? Uh, let me. Uh, is your screen being shared, Neil? Uh, not yet. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear, but I can only see your photo, um, your 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 uh, video. But uh, can you share your screen? I am sharing. Uh, you are sharing. Uh, yeah. Ah, sweet. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay, Neil, please. And uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yin Jay. Um, can, can you hear me properly? Yes, we can. All right. Excellent. So, uh, so let me begin. I. Uh, I sincerely apologize for not being there. I would have loved to be there in person, um, but, uh, and we'll have to make do with Zoom. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, in fact, I spent six months in uh, Durban as a small boy uh, because my mother went to prison uh, in South Africa for resisting apartheid. And my father was already in prison and so I came to Durban and spent six months with my grandmother who, who lived there in Kloof. So uh, I'm very fond of uh, Durban and Natal and of course, South Africa. 
uh, and, and it's a place of my roots. So I'm going to tell you about something very new, uh, very radical, and to me at least very exciting. Uh, this is a new theory of the universe. Uh, when I emphasize new, that means it's not yet accepted. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an idea regarding how the universe might uh, be arranged. And uh, it's an idea which I have developed with my younger collaborator, Latham Boyle. He's at Perimeter Institute. And if you look online, you'll find a series of papers about this topic. So, uh, okay. Let me just begin by emphasizing that mathematics and astronomy, i.e. understanding the universe, uh, began in Africa. Uh, the oldest mathematical artifacts in the world are African, and, uh, and the oldest uh, artifacts uh, which were built using mathematics. And in my view, it's absolutely time for Africa to reclaim its uh, pioneering efforts in mathematical science. Uh, and it's very important to do so now because mathematical science really is driving uh, the economy of the future and not just the economy, but uh, the information and ultimately the power in the world is being determined by those people who have access to uh, mathematical science and all its spin-offs like artificial intelligence and, uh, and so on. So it's really vital for Africa to invest in its talented youth. Africa has an advantage compared to the rest of the world in having a young population. And uh, in uh, several decades time, in fact, a good fraction of the world's youth will be African. So it's not just vital for Africa, it's vital for the world that we invest in training and uh, providing opportunities for Africa's youth in science and maths. And that is the objective of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, which I helped to found. And we are aiming to graduate uh, 10,000 uh, young scientists uh, in Africa in the next decade at master's and PhD level. Now, why do we need a new theory of the universe? So let me briefly describe the current consensus. Uh, the current consensus is that the Big Bang was not describable by science. It's too weird. Uh, the whole universe was at a point that was the beginning of time, whatever that means. It's almost a contradiction. And uh, then people have developed a, a model called the inflation model, which essentially amounts to throwing in some explosive uh, just after the beginning of time. And that explosive blows the universe up to a very large size and makes it smooth and flat in agreement with what we see. Uh, that uh, theory of inflation has dominated the field for 40 years, uh, and recent observations are now testing that theory in an absolutely amazing way. They're showing us the universe on large scales at high accuracy and allowing us to test this theory's prediction. Well, the theory is not doing that well because one of its predictions is there should be what are called tensor modes. These are also called long wavelength gravitational waves, which would have been produced by this explosive expansion of the universe. So that's a unavoidable signature of this inflationary epoch. And then the question is quantitative. How much of that signal do you expect to see? And so that is measured by this number R. R measures the fraction of uh, deviation from uniformity in the microwave background in, in the radiation from the Big Bang due to these long wavelength gravitational waves. So I had a bet with Stephen Hawking that, uh, that this number would be less than 5%. And uh, Stephen was a very brave uh, guy in making bets. He bet it would be greater than 5%. And unfortunately, he didn't live to see the results, but you can see here are the latest experiments 
showing that this number is less than 3%. It keeps decreasing. And these models of inflation are progressively being ruled out. So the consensus view is not doing very well uh, in, con in uh, comparison with the data. But that's not the real reason why I think we need an alternative. The real reason is that the consensus, consensus model leads to wild, explosive expansion across space and uh, to something which people call the inflationary multiverse. So in their picture, we live in one of these little bubbles. And so we see certain laws of physics, we see uh, certain um, features in nature. But according to this model, uh, there are multiple universes uh, called the multiverse. And it's kind of random which one we ended up. Um, and so in my view, this is really a uh, catastrophic uh, failure of the theory. It doesn't predict anything. Um, and we see no evidence from observations of a multiverse. So I'm deeply skeptical. And I think this is a dead end in my humble opinion. So I'm motivated to start again and to look at the data afresh and try to see what it is telling us. Now, the data is absolutely amazing, as I mentioned before. We can fit the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, so here we are in the solar system. And as, as we look outwards, we look further out in space and further back in time. And what we see is the uh, formation of structure. This is this web-like structure, which led to galaxies and then and stars and planets and, uh, and places like the Earth. But uh, when we look outwards and, and map the whole visible universe, we see an amazingly simple uh, object. Uh, I like to say that the whole universe on large scales is simpler even than one bacterium. You know, bacterium is quite a complicated thing. Often they can move, they can respond to stimuli. We don't really understand how they work uh, in the sense of being able to predict what they will do. They're very unpredictable. But the universe on large scales is utterly simple and predictable. And that's why I'm encouraged to make uh, theories of it, mathematical theories, which can then be tested by observation. So the large scale universe is characterized by just five numbers. Three for the energy content. Uh, we have radiation in the form of photons, and, uh, and then we have baryons, uh, atomic nuclei, and of course, electrons making up atoms. There's a single number that characterizes how many um, nu atomic nuclear nucleons there are per photon. There's a second number which characterizes how much dark matter there is. There's very strong evidence for additional matter apart from uh, atoms in the universe. And uh, that's characterized by a certain number. And then there's the energy, of, the energy density of the dark energy. A uh, very, very simple form of energy, which now comprises about 70% of all the energy in the universe. As well as these three numbers, we see the impact of gravity in the gravitational potential. This is just Newton's uh, gravitational potential. It fluctuates from place to place in the universe with an amplitude, which is about three parts in 100,000. And this leads to temperature variation of about one part in 100,000 on large scales. And then we have a small tilt, just 0 0.02, that as you go to longer wavelengths or a smaller wave number K, you see slightly larger uh, amplitude of fluctuations. Very many quantities are consistent with zero. Um, and uh, so the universe has turned out to be stunningly simple uh, observationally. Here it is. Here's the picture of the cosmic microwave background. So it's projected onto this oval shape, but it actually represents a sphere which surrounds us. And so this is like a picture of the Earth uh, in an atlas, 
but uh, but it's the opposite because we're surrounded by the sky and now we've projected it onto this oval shape. And what you see in the picture, these tremendously simple random pattern of hot spots and cold spots. And you might say there's, you know, this is just random. Um, is that is that comprehensible? It just looks, uh, you know, a random mess. However, physicists are very good at making sense of uh, apparently random phenomena. And what you do with this pattern is you take a Fourier transform. You do that because the normal modes, the modes of vibration of the universe are actually um, like the modes of a bell. You know, if you strike a bell, it oscillates at uh, various frequencies and the universe likewise oscillates at various frequencies. And you reveal these modes by taking the Fourier transform of this map and plotting the power as a function of a wave number. This number L is essentially the wave number on the sphere. It's the spherical harmonic index. And so here's the power as a function of wave number. You see these beautiful oscillations. That's just the oscillations of a dense plasma of radiation um, as uh, coming out of the Big Bang and then vibrating on various uh, scales. I was very fortunate in the 90s, this was a new field, uh, the prediction of these uh, power spectra. And the previous literature people had claimed, uh, including actually Yinjie's uh, supervisor, who I won't uh, mention by name, they had claimed that there would be no polarization uh, or actually no correlation between the polarization of the sky and the temperature. Well, they were wrong. There is a correlation and you can calculate it. And it's a rather beautiful quantity because it has no free parameters at all. Once you fit the cosmology to the lower curve, the upper curve is absolutely predicted. And so we did those calculations uh, long before they were measured. And uh, the experimenters at the time said that's too difficult to measure. You see, this is a temperature variation in micro Kelvin. So that's one millionth of a degree Kelvin. And they said, we can't measure it. Uh, but uh, 10 years later, they were measuring it routinely. So um, never believe an experimentalist when they say they can't do something uh, because uh, 10 years later, they will be able to do it the things they didn't imagine being able to do before. So, uh, so here it is, it's amazingly simple. And uh, these red curves are entirely predicted by Einstein's theory of gravity and our understanding of plasma physics developed in the 1920s, um, plus those five numbers I told you before. So that's the large scale universe. Uh, what's happening on the small scales, on the tiniest scales we know of? So if you look on subatomic and subnuclear scales at the laws of physics, they're remarkably simple. And actually, it's the same story. The largest ever experiment was built, the Large Hadron Collider, to test the laws of physics on the smallest scales. It's basically a huge microscope. And uh, it revealed the laws of physics on subatomic nuclei scales. And this is what it showed us. It was uh, in precise agreement with theoretical expectation. And there was absolutely no evidence for anything beyond what we already knew. So on both very large scales and very small scales, the universe has turned out to be surprisingly simple and in absolute agreement with the laws which were previously known. Some people are very disappointed with that. They say, oh dear, you know, we, we haven't learned anything from uh, these experiments. Uh, I feel the opposite. I feel that what we've learned is that nature is cleverer than we are, and it's got away with uh, the laws of physics being incredibly economical. And uh, our job is to nevertheless make sense of the universe within these uh, fixed framework of uh, the standard model of physics that's shown in this slide and the laws of gravity as described by Einstein. So the universe is utterly predictable at the extremes, very small scales, very large scales. 
And actually, being a theorist, I'm allowed to extrapolate uh, to extremely small scales. Uh, this is the Planck length, much smaller than an atomic nucleus. And what we learn is that gravity provides a limit to what we can ever see on small scales. Uh, that if you tried, if you built a microscope to see the Planck length, the light would be so intense that you would only succeed in creating black holes. You could not see anything as small as this. You would just make black holes. On very large scales, there's a similar constraint that the laws of physics, apparently due to dark energy, apparently prevent us seeing anything larger than this scale ever. And the reason again is gravity, but instead of the attractive gravity, which causes collapse on small scales, we have repulsive gravity on large scales. That's a property of the dark energy that pushes the universe away from us so fast we can't see it. So as far as we can tell, the laws on small scales and large scales are very simple. Of course, the laws of physics and science are very complicated in the middle. And if you take the geometric mean of these two scales fixed by gravity, the lower limit and the upper limit of what we can see, the geometric mean is actually the size of a living cell. And this, is, this represents the most complex and unpredictable things in the universe. And of course, uh, life in, in the form of human beings is creating artificial intelligence and uh, future complex structures, uh, who knows what they will do. But all this is going on on the scales in the middle. Uh, so sometimes I call this the messy middle. Uh, physics is simple on very small scales and very large scales, but very messy in between. So here are all the laws of physics, uh, which we know of on small scales and large scales. This includes everything. I won't go through it, but it's gravity. It's uh, the forces, uh, the particles, and this uh, Higgs field, which um, so I'm very privileged to hold the Higgs chair. Uh, Peter Higgs was an unusual person who uh, realized that there's this strange substance called the Higgs field, and uh, this Higgs field uh, endows particles with uh, some of their key properties. My point of view is that perhaps this story is nearly complete. Whenever we've looked recently for deviations, new particles, new phenomena, we have found that in fact this equation I've written down uh, is enough to explain everything. Our job is to understand this equation more deeply and how it manages to be co consistent, even though there are apparently uh, severe problems within it. And I won't dwell too deeply on these problems, but it's the job of theorists like me to get rid of these problems. My point of view is that the most basic puzzles uh, about the universe are our best clues to how to uh, interpret and understand these laws of physics. The biggest puzzle is the Big Bang singularity, that the entire universe uh, popped out of a point 13.7 um, billion years ago. Uh, and uh, that seems indescribable, but our new resolution of the Big Bang singularity uses certain mathematical properties. I won't dwell on them. Uh, and so I, th and I think understanding the Big Bang singularity is actually key to, uh, to understanding the, the state of the universe today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the second big puzzle. What determines the large scale geometry of the universe? Why is it so symmetrical and flat? Uh, Einstein's theory allows the universe to be very curved and warped like a sphere or a saddle a horse saddle, but it isn't. It is uh, absolutely flat on very large scales to very high precision, about one part in 100,000. And uh, the resolution of this, I'm going to describe to you in a moment. There's another big puzzle. How do you couple quantum fields like the electromagnetic field and its quanta, which are photons, to gravity? 
As soon as you try to do that, you discover there's an infinite energy in the vacuum. And uh, theorists like me have become quite good at ignoring this infinity. But in fact, that is kind of uh, uh, ignoring a huge clue. Um, and uh, the resolution of that is a new cancellation mechanism. I won't have time to talk about this, but it, it's, it's a bit technical. You'll find it in our, in our papers, but it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and then the others, I'll talk a bit about dark matter. And what I'm going to argue is that in fact, we already know what the dark matter is. There's no great mystery. Uh, there's a clear candidate and uh, for strange reasons, more or less uh, sociological reasons, it was overlooked uh, since the 1970s. And so I'll explain to you what that is. Now, the large scale geometry of the universe. So Roger Penrose, who's a recent uh, Nobel Prize winner for understanding the inevitability of the formation of black holes, uh, Roger Penrose um, de describes the beginning of the universe with this picture. So here is the creator. And you see they are choosing a very special point in the space of all possible universes. And this is a, a huge puzzle, uh, which uh, we now claim to have resolved. Um, in order to show you how uh, to motivate our solution and describe our solution, think of a much simpler problem. Why is the Earth quite flat uh, when you look at it locally, the surface of the Earth? Why is it quite flat? And uh, so if you travel uh, five or 10 kilometers, uh, you know, and you make a map of your surroundings, uh, they are pretty, pretty flat. And as you see in, in this picture uh, that NASA made uh, from space, the Earth is really like a polished marble. It's beautifully round and smooth, uh, slightly distorted because it's spinning, but, uh, but really it's extremely round and extremely flat. Why? Why is that? Well, one explanation is that somebody made it that way. You know, there was a, a god or somebody came along and they liked the idea of a round Earth, and so they polished it and they hammered it into shape. Now, uh, the inflation mechanism is a little bit like this. You want to understand why the universe is big and smooth. And so you introduce some dynamite <clears throat> to blow it up and uh, smoothen it out. But in fact, that's entirely unnecessary because there's a much better explanation. And the explanation is that the Earth is very large. It's made of about 10 to the 50 atoms. Uh, that's more or less an accident of history, that, that it's a, a very large object. And then secondly, you have gravity pulling the atoms inwards and, and down and inwards towards the center, and you have dissipation. So if a mountain collapses, you know, it stays down. It doesn't bounce like a rubber ball. It stays down. That's because of dissipation. And its energy, the potential energy due to gravity in the mountain is, is transferred into heat and sound. And there's so many more ways to distribute that energy among the atoms of the earth, that uh, which is what we call entropy, the number of ways of distributing energy, so much more entropy in, in putting all that energy into heat that actually the mountains uh, uh, tend to collapse and, and never form. And so ultimately it's thermodynamics and entropy which explains why the earth is so round. Now, Stephen Hawking, who was a close friend of mine and um, I brought him to South Africa um, uh, in 2008 and um, he, uh, I, introduced, I was very lucky to introduce him to Nelson Mandela. Um, and if you go to Ames, there's a beautiful sculpture of Stephen Hawking in the, in the entrance of the Institute. Um, that was the only time he came to Africa. But Stephen Hawking probably had the greatest insight of any uh, theorist in the 20th century into how we reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics. And his great discovery was this 
field of black hole thermodynamics, where he pointed out or realized that a black hole, that's this object in the middle, is after all not completely black. It has a temperature which is inversely proportional to its mass, and it has an entropy. And you can think of this as the number of ways the black hole could have formed. Uh, and the entropy is proportional to its area. And here, zeros and ones have been placed all over the area to indicate that there are many possible states for the black hole. So Hawking showed black holes have entropies. His calculation is still very mysterious. Uh, it, it uses some very elegant mathematical tricks, but uh, it leaves many people nervous as to what it actually means. Uh, we don't probably, we don't understand the quantum theory of gravity. And so you can think of Hawking's picture of black hole entropy as basically a glimpse into uh, the future of quantum gravity, uh, where we, we don't really understand the foundations. Uh, a parallel you might draw is the ideal gas law. You know, this was understood long before statistical mechanics. Uh, it was understood that the ideal gas law works and indeed the concept of entropy and so on. It was only much later when people understood um, that matter is made out of atoms and uh, that energy is quantized that uh, people could actually give uh, rigorous de mathematical definitions of entropy. So Hawking's work is sort of a glimpse into the, into the quantum gravity without providing the foundation. So recently we used the same Hawking trick uh, and uh, found some new analytical solutions for a realistic set of cosmologies, including radiation, non-relativistic matter like the dark matter and the baryons, uh, dark energy, and space curvature. So we were able to solve the equations for the universe analytically for the first time. And using them, we calculated the gravitational entropy. So we calculated the number of states corresponding to a given set of cosmological parameters. This was very surprising that we were able to do this. And, uh, and the result was even more surprising. The result was that the most likely universes are flat, homogeneous, and isotropic on large scales. You don't need any mechanism like inflation to explain that. Uh, it's just a consequence of thermodynamics. So I'm not going to give the details. It's quite a technical subject and just refer you to our papers. But as you can imagine, this has created quite a stir in the field because the standard explanation, which has held for 40 years, is apparently unnecessary. Now, uh, the second topic is how do we couple gravity to quantum fields? Uh, as soon as you try to do this, you encounter profound difficulties. And this has been known for a long time, at least since the 1970s and long before, that the vacuum energy is infinite and actually even breaks Lorentz invariance. It's more like uh, quantum fluctuations of a radiation fluid uh, in the vacuum. So people have discovered ways to subtract it, but, uh, but it leaves you very uneasy because you have this infinity, which gravity responds to because gravity is sensitive to all forms of energy. And then you have to remove, remove it before you can do anything. Uh, it's worse than this because when you place the standard model of uh, quantum fields on a curved spacetime, uh, like the universe, then the symmetries of the theory are spoiled by these quantum mechanical infinities. And in fact, this leads to great trouble when you couple it to gravity, uh, you're going to get all kinds of infinities and, uh, and difficulties in the quantum theory. String theory and supergravity have been successful at somewhat reducing these problems, but at a very high price. You need a huge number of extra fields, particles, and even dimensions of space. And again, this uh, points to a multiverse, which uh, makes the theory completely unpredictive. So we've recently discovered a much more economical approach. It's uh, again, a little technical. It involves something called dimension zero fields. 
um, and I just refer you to our papers. So I'm not saying our uh, our solution is uh, is the best one or the only one. I I hope above all that our work um, inspires some young person, much younger person, to create an even more uh, radical approach uh, to unifying the laws of physics, uh, which again will hopefully be much more economical than the theories which have dominated in recent years. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the dark matter. Um, here again is the standard model. I mentioned that in, in my view, there's an obvious explanation of the dark matter. Well, here it is. You see, these three right-handed neutrinos do not couple to the uh, forces, the gauge particles, which mediate forces, strong, weak, and electro electromagnetic forces. These right-handed neutrinos don't even couple to those forces. They couple to gravity, and they couple to the Higgs boson. So they're very weakly coupled, and therefore they would appear dark. If you shine light on them, it won't bounce off them. They are dark. So something we realized recently is that one of them uh, can very easily be the dark matter. Uh, the way this works is that the left-handed neutrinos, which are very light, would occasionally oscillate into or transform quantum mechanically into a very heavy right-handed neutrino. And because it's so heavy, they can't stay there. It's only a virtual particle. They have to, it has to oscillate back into a left-handed neutrino. And these oscillations are only possible because of the Higgs field in the vacuum. So this has been known, this mechanism has been known for a long time. It's called the seesaw mechanism because the heavier you make the right-handed neutrino, the weaker the oscillations, and therefore uh, the lighter the mass of the left-handed neutrino. So by being, making the right-handed one heavy, you make the left-handed one light. That's why it's called the seesaw mechanism. So that's been known for a long time. Now, if I want one of these to be the dark matter, I want it to be stable, so it should not decay. And so I actually have to switch off one of these couplings to make the right-handed neutrino stable. If I do that, it will be stable, it can be the dark matter, and it will only couple to gravity. How do you predict its abundance? Uh, this was our new contribution to the picture. Well, when you describe the Big Bang, you realize that they're actually, in, in a mathematical sense, two sides of it. And you can calculate how many right-handed neutrinos there are uh, created by the Big Bang itself. They're created by a kind as a kind of Hawking radiation from the Big Bang. If their mass is the right value, then they fit the observations. Now that's not a prediction, it's just a fit because very hard to test this experimentally. It's too heavy for any accelerator. But uh, the, uh, the, the fact that it's stable actually implies that one of the light neutrinos is massless. You see, if I switch off this coupling, then the right-handed guy will be stable, but equally the corresponding left-handed guy won't get a mass. It, 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 it is exactly massless. And that prediction will be tested in the next three to five years, actually using galaxy surveys. It's quite amazing that the most precise way we have of measuring the mass of very light neutrinos is by measuring the strength of gravity in galaxy clusters. So here's the data. We know mass differences. We do not know the absolute zero of, of the mass scale for the three observed light neutrinos. Here's the very latest data. Uh, and they indeed favor the lightest possible value for the lightest neutrino. They favor zero mass for the lightest neutrino. In the next um, three to five years, this will become very precise. And if the data continues to favor a massless light neutrino, the, the, the lightest one being massless, then our theory will be uh, easily, I would say, the most compelling candidate for dark matter. Here is a telescope in uh, Chile, an amazing new telescope. 
the prediction is that the total mass of the light neutrinos is 60 milli electron volts. That's a prediction if the lightest one is massless. And their sensitivity is going to be about 12 milli electron volts. Okay, so um, we're getting to the level of precision where this will be tested uh, very uh, precisely. Summary, we have a new theory. It's more predictive than the standard uh, version. It provides the most economical yet explanation for the dark matter, the large scale geometry of the universe, how gravity couples more consistently to quantum fields. And I haven't really talked about this. We can predict the density perturbations we see in the sky from first principles. There are a bunch of other problems which it addresses. A lot remains to be done, but these are encouraging signs. And nia bonga. Hey, uh, Neil Bunga, uh, Neil, thank you for your talk. And uh, now I think the, you know, the, the time is for the floor for, for our audience. Uh, any question from audience? Yes, Professor, who's running us? Who? I'm talking to the screen. Well, 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 connection, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, any questions? You? No? Okay, uh, uh, so two hands, I see two hands. Maybe uh, uh, Matthew, please. So, sorry, thank sorry, Matthew. You. Thank you. So Neil, thank you for your talk. Uh, very enlightening. I, I think I listened to it, uh, the online version where you, you, the talk you did with Brian Keaton recently. And yes. I listened to the entire thing. And uh, so, uh, very enlightening. And I think you've given some hint of what the dark matter is, and uh, that's been quite an unknown thing. What I want to know is: is the uh, universe accelerating? Expansion yeah. is the expansion accelerating? Yes, it seems to be. Um, it's very dramatic. But the way it was first discovered was from. Um, uh, plotting the um, luminosity of supernovae. And so you can imagine that a supernova, which is an exploding uh, star, a supernova has a standard brightness. And so if you see supernovae at different distances or rather at different brightnesses, you can interpret the brightness as a measure of the distance. And people have become quite sophisticated about doing that. So supernovae are what is called a standard candle. Um, and then if you measure their brightness and their velocity away from us, just by the Doppler shift, uh, then you can infer the expansion history of the universe. So that was the first discovery. I'll tell you the thing which convinced me that the universe is accelerating which is the, that there is another completely different physical consequence of acceleration. You know, when matter clumps, it makes a region of higher density, it also makes a gravitational potential. And so a photon falling into that potential becomes blue shifted, it gains energy. Now it turns out that if there is no acceleration, no dark energy, that when it, that the gravitational potentials are static, the a cluster forms and then its potential is fixed in time. So when a photon falls in and climbs out, there's no net uh, blue shift. However, if the universe starts to expand exponentially, that wipes out the gravitational potential. That actually causes space to expand so much that the gravitational potential goes to zero. So when a photon falls in, it gets blue shifted, and then it remains blue shifted. So this effect predicts that there will be a correlation between mass concentrations in the universe and the brightness of the microwave light which traveled through it. And so we proposed this in 96. Uh, again, it was very far from being observed. Finally, people have received re uh, reached the precision to measure it and it's been confirmed at 
people debate the significance, but at something like five uh, sigma, this effect has been observed. And so there is a completely independent physical effect of dark energy or cosmic acceleration, which has verified uh, that it is there. So yes, it seems to be there. It's really strange. And it basically tells us that we will never see, well, provided the dark energy really is a constant, we will never see more than a certain finite region of the universe. Okay, thank you very much. I see Thomas. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Thomas Conrad. I uh, have a question uh, concerning the vacuum energy. So, um, as we know, uh, the electromagnetic field, for example, can be uh, modeled as uh, uh, a lot of uh, non-coupled harmonic oscillators, and each harmonic oscillator uh, in quantum mechanics has a ground state energy that is not zero. And then if you add all the ground state energies, you would get infinity. Right. So uh, you are saying that uh, that these energies that I saw might be a candidate for dark energy, uh, that they are kind of canceling. And I'd, I'd like to know whether you can explain further how they cancel. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen again. Uh, hold on a second. I, I'm, I'm going to show you a slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. You 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 explained it perfectly. Um, uh, question is whether I have the right slide. Uh, sorry, I can't find the right slide now. Uh, wait. Yeah, I don't have the right slide. Let let me explain it in words. Um, as you say, every, quant every field is a collection of harmonic oscillators, infinite collection, and the energy in every oscillation mode is, is given by h bar times the frequency of the mode. So, uh, so uh, the naive count of the energy in the vacuum is infinity. Now, uh, it turns out that bosons, like photons, contribute positively, and fermions, like the electron, contribute negatively, okay? But in the standard model, there are uh, roughly three times more fermions than bosons. So actually, the vacuum energy is negative infinity, okay? Maybe even more puzzling. So it has the wrong sign, okay? And it is way too big. It's hugely too big. Okay. So basically, it's a disaster. Now, people kind of learned how to subtract it mathematically. And this really makes no difference to any experiment except one involving gravity. But it's so hard to do experiments with gravity that in practice, we have to rely on the whole universe. You know, the biggest volume of dark energy is exactly our observable uh, horizon volume. And its total gravity can be detected. And that's the acceleration of rate of the universe. So it was only recently that we were able to detect the dark energy. And we have only done so by using the whole universe as the detector. Now, what is our new mechanism? So I claim that the first step is to get rid of this minus infinity, OK? Um, People did so using supersymmetry for, for the last four decades, but this was very uneconomical. You had to double the number of particles. For every boson, you had to have a fermion, which is not observed, and vice versa. So our mechanism involves a new type of field, not much exploited in, in particle physics, called a dimension zero field. Uh, so it, a, a usual scalar field, like the Higgs field, is dimension one. These guys are dimension zero. They're unusual because they have four derivatives in their Lagrangian instead of two. And what we discovered, more or less by accident, is that if you add these dimension zero fields, they have exactly the right properties to set the total vacuum energy to zero and to cancel the two, uh, what I call trace anomalies, 
which are other sort of pathologies uh, to do with coupling gravity. So they have this mis miraculous effect. By the way, it only works if there are precisely three generations of particles in the standard model. It, uh, it works if they're three gen and only works if they're three generations. As far as I know, it's the simplest explanation for why there are three generations. Um, and actually the reason we even looked at these dimension zero fields is they have a spectrum of fluctuations in the vacuum, which matches what we see in the cosmic microwave sky. This is a scale invariant pattern of Gaussian fluctuations. And uh, that I, I think is a very profound clue as to what's going on in the vacuum. Uh, in the vacuum. And these dimension zero fields have all kinds of other amazing effects. They don't have any particles, by the way. There's not a single particle associated with them. All they do is distort the vacuum. So the only effect of these fields is to make gravity coupled to, coupled to matter a bit more consistent. Uh, we've only just started to explore this. It's very, very encouraging. Um, very much more remains to be done. Okay, uh, thank you, Neil, for this very uh, uh, detailed answer. I believe, right? Um, okay, but but for the time, I think it's uh, we we'll over run it over a little bit. And uh, thank you, Neil, for this very exciting talk. And uh, so let, let's give Neil applause. And thank you. Sorry, Neil. There we have run out of time, but there are a number of questions on the chat. So, if you wouldn't mind just answering them on the chat for our online audience while we carry on. I know, Neil. You have a flight back to UK this afternoon, right? When when, when is your flight? Hello. Uh, flight is at six six forty. So uh, so I can certainly yeah. do it before the flight. I will answer all the questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we wish Neil a, a smooth trip back from Cape Town to UK. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank so, you very uh, much. I forgot to mention. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Yeah, I will see you in other cosmology events probably. Yeah. So, um,